Hello everyone, welcome to this introduction to Hesiod's Theogony. So far we've set up the various ways of approaching the study of Greek myth, and looked into Minoan and Mycenaean roots of Greek culture and mythology. Today we get to dive into the myths themselves, yippee, by looking into what is probably the most systematic work of Greek mythology of all, especially in regards to questions of the origin of the cosmos, the gods, and human beings. Homer, a Homerid bard from the 8th or 7th century BC, is roughly Hesiod's contemporary. Sometimes his date is located significantly earlier than Hesiod, like 750 BCE, with Hesiod coming somewhat later, 675 BCE, but this is contested and the Greeks themselves usually considered Hesiod the earlier poet. When it comes to the biggest of all questions in Greek mythology, how did the world come to be, what is its essential nature or makeup, and what is the history of the world and of its gods? Homer himself gives us very little, almost nothing, an incomplete account of Genesis in the Homeric poems, tracing the beginnings of the world back, like in a related Orphic myth, to the gods Okeanos and Tethys. Significantly, Homer was part of a class or guild of bards, the Homerids, and this was the most common type of poet or bard one might discover. Hesiod is unique in a couple of ways here. One, He's the first individual poet who speaks in his own name in the Greek literary canon, Homer never coming out as the author of his songs. Two, he seems to have been a more low-born shepherd, perhaps self-educated, with a more realistic and perhaps bitter perspective on life. He was a Boeotian poet and his two main works are the Theogony and the Works and Days, although there are a few other manuscripts such as the Shield of Heracles sometimes attributed to him. The two things most often remembered about Hesiod is the importance which the Muses held to him in their haunt on Mount Helicon, and the fact that he gave the first fully worked out literary account of the genesis of everything among the Greeks. Alongside our textbook's translation of specific passages, this would be the moment in the course where you might pick up Apostolos Athanasicus's excellent edition of Hesiod's works, recommended reading for this class which I'll be drawing from quite a bit in this lecture. My other favorite translation of Hesiod is the Martin L. West translation, which you see here on the right. When it comes to the question of who was Hesiod and what we know about his life, Athanasicus notes that Hesiod is Hesiod's own best biographer. For what little we hear about him elsewhere is often fantastical or contradictory. In works and days, we get a few important biographical details. Hesiod was the son of an immigrant from Cume in Asia Minor. His father settled in Boeotia, close to the slopes of Mount Helicon. He tells us that he tended sheep in the foothills of this mountain and that one day he had a profound experience. He met the muses and they gave him the gift of song. Of course, modern readers always wonder if this is pure literary convention. But there is no reason to doubt it. For the archaic and classical Greeks, and from within the piety of their religion, the muses were literal goddesses, daughters of Zeus and memory. And as even Plato will later underline, no poet can expect to write adequate verses without some fundamental initiatory event of the muse's presence to the poet, as well as their guidance of the poet thereafter. Meeting or even being possessed by the muses, you might understand on the model of ritual possession, even speaking in tongues. The date of the composition of Hesiod's poems, especially Theogony, roughly coincides with the introduction of the alphabet in Greece. But like is also the case with Homer, we don't know if Hesiod himself wrote down his poems or when. We do know, however, that he is the oldest repository of Western culture when it comes to the theme of the origin of the cosmos and the many divinities within it. And as well, he's our first major witness to the social values and practices that make human culture possible. In his own day, Hesiod was considered a great poet, and he tells us he won a poetry prize once, an eared tripod, which he dedicated to his muses on Mount Helicon. We are certainly justified in saying that Hesiod is the first mythographer, but was he also the first philosopher, even the first mythologist, that is the first to give a logos of myth? This is often debated in ancient Greek philosophy, starting with the pre-Socratics, often criticize Hesiod and turn against myth. Nevertheless, as we'll see in the way that Hesiod poeticizes Greek myth, the philosophical tenor and intention of much of his work is undeniable. This is dense intellectual stuff. On this note, Athanasicus underlines that Hesiod was not trendy. The ideological orientation of his arguments is persistently didactic, and his purposeful and politically expedient use of myth and religion do not seem to have been the product of spontaneous creativity. Rather, of a deeply learned poet yet inspired by the muses. 
This was, funnily enough, Aristotle's own judgment looking back on Hesiod from the 4th century BCE, writing, And one might suppose that Hesiod was the first to seek for such things, i.e. a first cause, the beginning of everything. And in Hesiod's case, that first principle was love, desire, or eros. Hesiod is a very complex figure, although an accomplished mythographer and collector of lores. From across the Greek-speaking world, Hesiod as well trysts with the goddess Nemosune and her nine daughters, the Muses, of whom he speaks so movingly. His relationship to Nemosune and the Muses is not simply the chance encounter we find at the beginning of the Theogony, but a complex and ongoing arrangement that in Hesiod's case seemed to have involved the mind even more than the heart. Hesiod is also very distinctive in this period in that he chose to ignore Cleos, that is, a warrior's reputation or fame so central to the Homeric epics. As a peasant farmer, these warrior values simply weren't all they're cracked up to be. When Hesiod does speak of the heroic age, and perhaps scandalously to the Greeks, it is usually only to conclude that, quote, then death threw a dark mantle over them. That is, sounding for the first time the theme that the age of the heroes has passed. This, more than anything else, makes Hesiod an almost quintessentially modern poet. Hesiod's own image of thought or mythopoetics is both genealogical and physicalist setting things up in a sequence of generation, before and after. But what is stranger is that his gods don't always seem to be larger-than-life personages, but sometimes actual physical forces or elements in nature, a point which makes him closer rather than further away from the pre-Socratic philosophers who would follow. As Athanasicus puts this, Hesiod sang of primitive, yet very bold physics. That is, fundamentally, he was a poet of phusis or nature in the Greek sense. Many of his songs must have been lost on his audience, much as some aspects of modern physics are lost on average citizens today. Hesiod begins his poem, as does Homer, with an invocation of the muses. But unlike in Homer, where we hear sing muse of the rage of Achilles, or of the man with a mind of many twists and turns, Odysseus, that is unlike a more generalized muse, we hear of a very specific one. I begin my song with the Heliconian Muses, whose domain is Helicon, the great god-haunted mountain, whose soft feet move in a dance that rings, the violet dark springs, and the altar of mighty Zeus. They bathe their lithe bodies in the waters of Parmesos, or the Hippocrene, or of god-haunted Olmeos. On Helicon's peak they join their hands in lovely dances, and their pounding feet awaken desire. Hesiod goes on to invoke many of the Olympian deities associated with the Muses, especially Aegis-bearing Zeus and queenly Hera, before going on to relate the tale of how he himself one time encountered them as a shepherd walking on Mount Helicon. They, the Muses, once taught Hesiod beautiful song while he was shepherding his flocks on holy Mount Helicon. These goddesses of Olympus, daughters of Aegis-bearing Zeus, first of all spoke this word to me, Quote from the Muses themselves, O oh, you shepherds of the fields, base and lowly things, little more than bellies, we know how to tell many falsehoods that seem like the truth, but we also know when we so desire how to utter the absolute truth. One of the most commented upon lines in all of the Theogony, this statement from the Muses is really stunning, inaugurating as it does the long tradition, not only of the poet who tells many a lie, but of the muses who as well through their poetizing cast the veil of illusion and trickery over everything they wish. On the other hand, these muses also closely associate themselves with truth itself, the Greek word aletheia. And it is this truth that presumably they are now to communicate to the poet. Thus they spoke the fluent daughters of great Zeus, plucking a branch, to me they gave a staff of laurel, a wondrous thing, and into me they breathed a divine voice, breathing into the poet or what the Latins will call the afflatus, being the essential mechanism of poetic inspiration, so that I might celebrate both the things that are to be and the things that were before, and they ordered me to honor in my song the race of the blessed gods who exist forever, and also to sing of them themselves, the muses, both first and last. This is a bit of a change of the older Greek tradition in the Homeric hymns, for example, of always singing to the goddess Hestia, goddess of the hearth fire, both first and last. In Hesiod, the poet, it is the muses who have this honor. In his notes on these lines, 22 to 34, Athanasicus writes, what Hesiod describes in these lines has the appearance of a vision, an awe-inspiring encounter with some concrete manifestation of the divine. 
Eminent scholars have identified the generic elements that it shares with many other encounters of lawgivers, prophets, and poets with the divine, encounters that gave them special powers and at the same time changed their lives. Testimonies to such experiences abound even in our own day. Some people still include them in the scheme of what is possible, and one cannot prove or disprove them since to those who believe in them they are a priori real, whereas to non-believers they are again a priori aberrant figments of the imagination. To Hesiod, Helicon is God-haunted, as God-haunted as any temple for a person who believes in the deity worshipped in it. This is a great insight from Athanasicus, but I'm not exactly sure of his use of the term a priori here, philosophical term meaning independent of all experience, and therefore connoting something in the order of transcendental faith. The main point of Hesiod's epiphany is not a priori faith, but actual religious experience and even religious revelation from the muses themselves. On the muses' statement that they can tell many a lie, but know how to speak the truth when they wish, Athanachus paraphrases, Of course we can lie to you. We are goddesses. We do whatever we wish. But to you, we will tell the truth. The muses in Hesiod and in Greek culture generally are indeed powerful. They teach that the gods come and go, and that in the larger scheme of things, in Athanasicus' interpretation here, power determines truth. If the poet is like his teacher, the muses, he has a choice. He, too, can be a power broker. Again, this is a brilliant insight we'll see explored in a minute in Marcel Deschamps in terms of the trinity of king, priest, and poet. But is it the power to tell lies or to weave fantasies around our lives which the muses really have in mind here? Are the muses, like Hesiod himself here, possessed by a primitive kind of what Nietzsche would call the will to power? which supersedes and is even perhaps deeper than the will to truth? These are just some of the questions that arise when we attempt to understand the Muse's first enigmatic utterance here. What is the relation between truth and power, or truth and lies, we might ask? Hopefully, through the close study of Hesiod's Theogony, we can begin to formulate something of an answer. Apostolos Athanasicus is a renowned translator and classical scholar who taught at the University of Santa Barbara quite close to us, is now an emeritus professor living in Greece and very active in Hellenic revival movements there. In this lecture, we'll be doing a line-by-line -line interpretation of several passages in the Theogony, using not only our textbook, but also Athanasicus, Dece, and eventually the German philosopher Friedrich Schelling as our guides. In his preface to the new American edition of the Masters of Truth, Dece begins with the observation that for inquirers of the archaic and of beginnings, Truth provides a fascinating archaeology, ranging from Hesiod's muses to the daughters of the sun, who go to meet the poet-philosopher Parmenides in their chariot and take him on a journey to meet the goddess of truth. Truth, the muses, the daughters of the sun, have ever been in Greek culture, myth and religion, the guides of the man who knows. From Homer to Hesiod, however, the relationship between the bard or poet and these daughters of memory undergoes a transformation and becomes more complex. In the Iliad, the muses are all-knowing, and thanks to them, the poet can see perfectly into all the events that he relates in his poem. It is because he is inspired by the muses that the Homeric bard claims to be able to relate all the accounts that took place in the Trojan War or the long wanderings of Odysseus as if he were really there, watching those events transpire through the muses' gaze. But Hesiod of Boeotian Ascra speaks in the first person as well as in the third. An author who is both poet and prophet is present and is chosen by the muses who now assume new modalities of speech. As always in the study of Greek myth and religion, everything hinges on questions of translation. And the muses say to Hesiod they know how to say many false things from the Greek word pseudais, which is sometimes an antonym of true things from the Greek word alethes, but which probably means something more like, as Deche underlines here, deceptive things. That is, things which may not, strictly speaking, be false, but rather shimmer with veils of illusion. And so here, the muses' saying is translated as, we know how to say many false things which seem to be real. Is this what the truth of the muses, now to be uttered to Hesiod, really entails? Not only that the things said are true, but also that they are understood as true as the truth. That is due to the very power of the muses to play always between deception and understanding. For Deche, what is most significant in the muses' utterances here has to do with the position of the first and the third person. 
Not only is Hesiod novel in speaking in both tenses, but amazingly the muses themselves can be seen as reflecting on the subject of their narrative and on its structure. These are self-conscious muses who willfully deceive and complicate human understanding and are aware of the power of their narratives and their construction. At the same time, these are muses who instantiate and communicate a basic experience of truth, and so become the object of Hesiod's own will to truth, that is, to the true understanding, which is the point of the muses' art. As to the word truth itself here, Deche notes that Aletheia designates the register of the intelligible, that of the true understanding of the work produced by Hesiod and his post-Homeric muses. The opposite of truth or aletheia is not pseudice or deceptiveness, but rather lethe, usually translated as forgetfulness or oblivion. Lethe is far from simply being a kind of unawareness, but is in Hesiod's poem as we'll see just as much a divine power as our words of deception. On the one hand, truth and understanding, and on the other, pseudice logoi, that is, deceptive utterances personified in Hesiod as a god and listed among the children of night, Nyx, along with sleep and death. Other topics in Hesiod's 120-line invocation to the Muses, as we've seen, include the relation of the Muses to Helicon and Helicon's peak, the symbolism of the violet dark spring and the Muses' round dances, relation of the Muses to Zeus's altar, the actual location of these springs and rivers in which they bathe and frolic, has been extensively reconstructed, you can go today to Mount Helicon, to many of these exact sites that Hesiod sings about, and the opening goes on to invoke the Olympians, the goddess Dion, the older gods. We might spend a whole lecture exploring the meaning of the poet's staff and the laurel to adorn it, as well as the mythical and ritual relationship of the god-haunted Helicon to other sacred places graced by the muses or other deities. Also in this opening, Hesiod names the nine muses, we'll return to that later in the course, and himself suggests that the muses have a special relationship with poets, with kings, and with society at large, writing that the muses make the words that flow on the tongue honey sweet, and all the people look up to him, that is to Zeus, the greatest king, as with firm justice he gives his verdict, so the muses are not only associated with deception, truth, and understanding, but as well with justice and the close relation of kings to Zeus. For everything we've discussed so far, the textbook devotes only one sentence. Hesiod's attention to the muses is steeped in a religious aura of divinely inspired revelation. As he begins his genesis, he asks the muses, quote, Tell me how first gods, earth, rivers, the boundless sea, the shining stars, and the wide heavens above came into being. And this is their answer which point we get at line 116 in the work, the first Greek creation myth, and indeed the oldest one, we'll be studying in this course. It begins in the textbook translation, Verily, very first of all, chaos came into being, but then wide-bosomed Gaia, secure foundation of all forever, and dark Tartarus in the depth of the broad land, and Eros, the most beautiful of all the immortal gods, who loosens the limbs and overwhelms judgment and wise counsel in the breast of gods and humans. From chaos, Erebus, the gloom of Tartarus and black night came into being, and from night were born Aether, that is the upper atmosphere, and Day, whom night bore when she became pregnant after mingling in love with Erebus. Weeks could be spent deciphering syllable by syllable these nine lines, the most famous Greek creation myth. How shall we interpret it? and introduce all these most archaic gods. In my view, the textbook takes a somewhat easy way out here. It is our conviction, the authors write, that the other three most primordial deities, that is Gaia, Tartarus, or Eros, arose out of chaos as the primal source of creation. So on this reading of Hesiod's creation narrative, chaos is the source of everything, and Gaia, Tartarus, Eros as well, darkness and night are all the children of chaos. Perhaps this is an easier narrative for us to wrap our heads around, but in my opinion it really confuses what Hesiod is getting at here. The more standard and I believe more correct way to read Hesiod's protogenoi, that is firstborn deities, is to lay them out in a map that looks somewhat more like this. On the one side chaos and the first children of chaos, and then as independent principles Eros, Gaia, and Tartarus. Sometimes these four first deities are protogenoi, are called ungenerated deities, suggesting perhaps that they themselves were not born. 
and have no parents, but this as well is a misreading. Hesiod clearly calls them Protogonoi, that is, the firstborn deities. Where exactly they are born from, however, we do not hear. So already in approaching Hesiod's creation myth in the Theogony, we have a significant puzzle to work out. Why are there four firstborn deities in Hesiod? Does he perhaps know their genealogies as well, but is unable to say them? Or does this simply reflect the limits of his own knowledge? We have here a kind of proto-theory of the elements. And first and most importantly, what would it mean to say that it is from these four deities in particular that everything else came to be? What exactly is Hesiod thinking in laying out these four deities as the ground floor, so to speak, for both human and divine understanding of the cosmos? In order to understand this, we have to look to Hesiod's idea of birth, which according to Athanasicus is not a creation ex nihilo, rather a creation ex ignoto, creation from the unknown. He writes, Hesiod's idea of the birth of the world has no truly metaphysical dimension. It is a physical world born not ex nihilo, but ex ignoto from the unknown. Here in Hesiod's thought, mingled with an inability to go beyond these limits, there is a great deal of fierce intellectual honesty, and by implication a stubborn refusal to believe that anything, including chaos, can be born of nothing. Everything that exists must have its coming to be, the causes of its birth. Which we might think is a pretty philosophical note for a great mythological poet to be sounding already in the 7th to 8th century BCE. What Hesiod's text says literally is that in the beginning chaos was born, and then the earth does not say the earth was born from chaos, plead that the earth as well was born. This for Athanachesis means just what it says. It implies that we really do not know how these two were born. Hesiod does not explain the creation of the primal elements themselves, but the creation of everything else through a process of procreation in which the god Eros or love is the ever-present catalyst. Nor does he elaborate Eros as a cosmic force. We hear almost nothing else about Eros in what follows. Nevertheless, since most of the Theogony is an account of birth following birth through processes of attraction and copulation, the conclusion that Eros is the silent partner or the fecundating male principle god here is inescapable. Before looking into the essential nature of Eros in Hesiod's poem, as well as Gaia and Tartarus, however, should begin as Hesiod himself does with the first of all deities here mentioned, chaos. This does not mean, as it will eventually mean in the Roman poet Ovid, a jumbled heap or disordered mess to which order must be brought, but it has a much more subtle and powerful physicalist meaning, perhaps resembling the later concept of the void in the atomist philosophers. Literally, the Greek word chaos means yawning void, abyss or chasm, or chasma mega, that is great chasm, something more like a gap, or what Norse mythology calls Ginunga Gap. According to Athanasicus, Hesiod peered through the darkness to discover the primal elements of his rough physics as chaos, Gaia, and Tartarus, floating in the immensity of the cosmos, where the principle of attraction, Eros, is the one that holds these elements together. This retrogressive journey into the mystery of creation is awesome, yet no mistake should be made. For Hesiod, this is neither a spiritual journey nor the product of a detached meditation. Rather, it is a singer's way of explaining the tangible, the visible, and imaginable material universe in terms of matter. Athanasicus here, Hesiod is the first proper materialist, but a materialist for whom matter or the primal elements are still divinities. Hesiod proceeds to explain the divine genealogy in the way in which he might have explained genealogical trees and the relationships in his village. Chaos and earth never mate with each other, but separately they become the progenitors of all beings. Chaos begets children like herself, dark, gloomy, and intangible, and earth too begets children like herself, visible, solid, and tangible. Indeed, among these four firstborn deities, it is only Chaos and Gaia who have complex lineages to speak of, Tartarus being more of a place or the limits of existence, and Eros simply the force of attraction that incipiates things or holds them together. This is a fascinating observation regarding the Hesiodic cosmovision. Chaos, the yawning abyss or gap, the mother of invisible children and forces, and Gaia, the mother of all things that manifest visibly and tangibly. 
This is almost already in Hesiod, something resembling Plato's twofold world of the sensible and the supersensible. Regarding the first children born of chaos, that is, night and darkness, or Nix and Erebus, this is as well a very peculiar moment in the Theogony, where we might ask, how do night and darkness mate in order to give birth to children so opposite to themselves? Is this an early statement even in Hesiod of the principle of the unity of opposites, and even an almost Taoist type account of the birth of manifestation and presence, out of the darkness within darkness that is the Tao? Can we translate Hesiod's chaos as the Tao, for example? Athenakisis makes an interesting observation here, quote, Darkness of one kind and darkness of another kind unite, perhaps collide, to produce light. And again, light of two types. The one that suffuses cosmic spaces, the ether that shimmers, and the irradiating of light itself in the phenomena dawn. For Athanasicus, here again, we have the beginnings of both the physical and the divine cosmos. And we might note here that Athanakis' interpretation of Hesiod as a first consistent physicalist is probably not the only interpretation. The way Hesiod uses myth, specifically the way that all the later generations of deities are either in the invisible lineage of chaos or the visible one of Gaia, if we read Hesiod in this way, we might be tempted to read him as the first metaphysician of the West. Athanakis goes on to make a connection between Chaos and Tartarus on the one hand, and Gaia and Eros on the other. Tartarus, the darkest part of the netherworld, lies below Hades, and is the subterranean realm of gloom proper. We might say the place in the cosmos that comes closest to non-being itself. Tartarus in this way is unproductive, unlike Chaos. They are both associated in some way with what is not. Gaia and Eros on the other hand are principles reflecting a fullness of being, and a fullness of manifestation in the process of generation. The earth is bored not to fill the chasm of chaos, but to be the secure seat of the immortals alongside the children of chaos. In this way, Tartarus and Gaia are actually quite close ontologically or in terms of their being, since the roots, sources, and the ends of Tartarus itself, as well as the earth, sky, and sea, all entwined together in Tartarian darkness. While some textbooks attempt to situate Hesiod's cosmos and its three levels of upper, middle, and lower world in later cosmological speculation, probably the roots of Hesiod's own speculations here point backwards rather than forwards to the idea of a great cosmic tree or axis mundi image, a sort of tree of creation whose top is the sky, a sky that rests on the earth and whose highest point corresponds to the lowest point of Tartarus. Tartarus and Gaia are, in the sense of physical existence, chaos as the yawning abyss presumes emptiness, and it is this implied emptiness into which chaos is itself born. Hesiod does not start with chaos in order to explain the birth of the earth, but rather with two entities of unknown origin, earth and chaos, and this is because the genealogical tree he is about to construct makes more sense if he postulates two separate progenitors one ultimately a progenitor of the physical universe, sky, sea, and so forth, in which man lives, and a world of the gods who rule it and its destiny, and on the other a progenitor of darkness, night, and of the host of the negative forces which plague man. Although it is often glossed over, the subsequent generations or genealogical tree from chaos is extremely complex. We've already seen how darkness and night mate to give birth to lightness and day, a process which we can understand as a whole as implying the relation between veiling and unveiling, concealment and revelation, that is the very process of truth. And this is perhaps the good kind of chaos. On the other, there are the children of night itself. Stupidity, accursed passions, death, sleep, revenge, strife. And among this generation of deities, it is era strife, which can be either good or bad, that is the most productive. Here are some of the negative forces which spring from Eris, among which we find lethe, forgetfulness or oblivion. In contrast to this tree of the children of chaos, we have the full world of Gaia, Gaia first giving birth by herself or parthenogenetically, without a male partner, to the sky, Uranos, the mountains, Uria, and the sea, Pontos. Gaia's only child with Tartarus is Tufaios, the evil snake monster. It is the lineage of Gaia and Uranos of the marriage of earth and sky from which we get all the titan deities, the furies, the giants, the nymphs of the ash tree, and subsequently the Olympians, who we'll get to know better later in the course. 
on the primacy and mystery of the god Eros, what the Romans will come to call Cupid or Amor, what Plato will eventually understand as a mere demigod. The textbook brings in what is the closest cosmogonic myth we have in the Greek sources to Hesiod's own Theogony, that is in the much later play by Aristophanes, The Birds, in which we read, Chaos, Night, Black Erebus, and Broad Tartarus were first, but Gehe, Air, the Lower Atmosphere, and Uranus Sky did not exist. In the vast hollows of Erebus, first of all, black-winged night alone brought forth an egg, from which Eros, the desirable, burst forth like a swift wind, his back glistening with golden wings. He mingled in broad Tartarus with chaos, winged and dark as night, and hatched our race of birds, and first led it to the light. There was no race of immortals before Eros caused all things to mingle, from the mingling of couples, Uranus, Okeanos, Gay, and the immortal race of all the blessed gods came to be. Aristophanes' source here is less the Hesiodic myth in the Theogony, and more the competing Orphic tradition, which is very similar in some specifics, but radically different in others. Aristophanes' intention here is to parody the Orphic tradition. In Hesiod, this process of revelation, manifestation, or truth appears in the genealogy of chaos itself. The birth of Eros is not accounted for. In the Orphic version, Eros, also known as Bromius or Erichpios or Phanes, is the one who first shone forth or gave light to creation when he was born from the cosmic egg, which split, thus separating night and darkness from brightness and day, that is, within the very emergence of the firstborn god, Protogonos, Eros himself. We'll go into much more detail on these fascinating differences between Hesiod's Theogony and the various Orphic cosmogonies, which have survived only in fragmentary form later in the course. For now, we can note simply that Hesiod's version is the more canonical one for the average Greek. So when we read Hesiod's Theogony, we are, in a way, reading the Bible of Greek mythology. One more note on this vexed question of whether Hesiod is simply a poet mythographer, or at the same time also a proto-philosopher. As the textbook also notes, by the time of the Roman poet Ovid, chaos had become an unformed mass of elements. Perhaps this process began very early, for example, in one of the first philosophers, Anaximander, posited the indefinite, infinite, or a pyron as the ordering and generative source of everything that is limited and finite, the pyron. Was the apyron in Anaximander a kind of chaotic substance? Precisely not the gap of Hesiod? In any case, from Anaximander to Ovid, we can see the thrust of cosmogonic narrative. It moves from chaos to cosmos from the yawning chasm to the dance of the stars. In yet another translation of the key lines here in Hesiod, first of all, chaos came to be, but then afterwards, broad-breasted earth. In his article, first of all came chaos, in the volume Heidegger and the Greeks, contemporary scholar Drew Highland asks, why then does Hesiod, after saying that first of all chaos came to be, add, but then afterwards, not just earth and Tartarus came into being, but also eros, does this not suggest Hesiod's recognition that before there could be anything like genealogical parenting, there must be Eros? Well, probably yes, but the more significant and interesting point which Highland underlines is that in Hesiod's image of thought, coming to be happens, and happens first as difference or giving birth. Hesiod's world is not a world of stable first principles which are fully in being, and only subsequently fall into becoming, rather a world in which becoming or differentiation is primary, and this seems underlined by Hesiod himself in highlighting that chaos was born first, before Earth. In other words, not being or a stable ontology of permanent presence is at stake in Hesiod, but rather the generative process of coming to be itself. As David Farrell Krell puts this, differentiation seems to come to be prior to all and sundry beings. It's their genesis, suggests that differentiation is prior. In other words, Hesiod thinks the process of differentiation or becoming in his genealogies from chaos or from Gaia, but doesn't give this becoming a name, a name any more complex than simply giving birth. We are far from having exhausted these first few lines, but hopefully we've navigated some of the complexities involved here, and I recommend you go off and give it a close reading now for yourself. After the invocation to the Muses and the earliest deities of the creation myth, 
Tid goes on in lines 126 to 132 to poeticize Gaia's prodigious fertility. Gaia first brought forth starry Uranos, equal to herself, so that he might surround and cover her completely and be a secure home for the blessed gods forever. And she brought forth the lofty mountain ranges, charming haunts of the divine nymphs who inhabit the hills and dales. And she also bore, without the sweet union of love, Pontus, the barren deep, with its raging surf. These three children of Gaia, Uranos, the sky or heavens, Orea, or the mountain ranges, and Pontus, or the briny deep, will in turn account for the emergence of every other physical feature of the world and all the deities within it. Interestingly, Gaia will mate with only two of her three children. In her unions with Pontus, or the sea, she will give birth to the brood of monsters, which we'll cover in week five when we approach Greek monster myth. The mountains, or Urea, seem to be barren and never produce offspring, probably reflecting the fact that the higher up a mountain you go, the less life you find, until at the peak, the pillar of heaven, there is only snow and a vision of the whole of earth and sky. Most significantly for the narrative that will follow, Gaia, the primal mother goddess, not only gives birth to her most important son, Uranos, the sky, but also mates with him in a kind of disastrous sacred wedding. We moderns, of course, know better and think that it is the sky or the cosmos from which the earth has emerged, satellite of the sun, as the sun is a satellite of other suns, galaxies of galaxies, all the way back in an uninterrupted chain of succession or causality leading to the Big Bang. Is Hesiod really so wrong here? Doesn't the Big Bang itself require this mysterious emergence within it, some material principle, the atom, from out of the chaos or black hole of the void, emerging mysteriously in infinite quantity, and initiating the process of differentiation to follow that will eventually give rise to planets on which creatures like us can stand and look up at the sky? And is it not also the case that one needs a planet and a perspective within it in order for the sky to be at all. Being out in orbit is no sky, but simply a vast vista into full and empty cosmic space. Although the incest motif in the mating or marriage of earth and sky may be distasteful to us, there is truth to it as well. For is it not the interaction of earth and the lower atmosphere of sky, say through the weather and the winds that fertilizes and fecundates the earth? Hesiod's way of retelling it here, in the earliest times, earth and sky were more closely united though they were eventually separated and the deep regions of heaven withdrew beyond the lower atmosphere. From the first three children of Gaia and Uranos, we hear, all these did she bear without mating in sweet love, but then she did couple with Uranos to bear deep eddying Okeanos, Koyos and Krios, Hyperion and Neapatos, Thea and Rhea, Themis and Nemosune, as well as gold-wreathed Phoebe and lovely Tethys, Kronos, the sinuous-minded, was her last-born, a most fearful child. This is, of course, the generation of deities known as the Titans, most important children of Earth and Sky, which we'll now have to look into in more detail. Before we do, it's important to underline that the theme of the mating or hierogamy, sacred wedding of Earth and Sky, is the first of three such great weddings in the Greek myth of succession. The marriage of Gaia and Uranos as rulers of the cosmos gives way to the marriage of Kronos and Rhea as the new rulers, and finally the rule of the Olympians overseen by Zeus and Hera. More on this later. First of all, let's look into the Titans themselves. How to understand the children of Earth and Sky, the Titans as a group in their essential nature, and each one of them, is a more difficult topic than it might at first seem. From later Greek sources and just getting a flavor for how the Titans are treated in later myth and philosophy, the most general impression we get is that they're more savage elemental gods more closely connected to nature versus the Olympians who are the more proper models for human civilization. But the picture is much more complicated than that, for at the same time the Titans ruled in the Golden Age, and although most of them end up in Tartarus, several of them remain above ground or in the sky continue to have important roles in the overseeing of Zeus's Olympian cosmos. In order to begin to more deeply understand this theme of the marriage of Earth and Sky and the nature of the Titans, I'll turn now briefly to the German philosopher Friedrich Schelling, who has the distinction within the modern history of Western philosophy of taking the philosophical meaning of myth more seriously than anyone else. As a young schoolboy, he wrote a short text with his friends Hödlin and Hegel, on our need for a new mythology, 
as well as many essays and talks on the nature of mythology among the Greeks. After rising to fame through his publication of less esoteric philosophies, such as his theory of transcendental idealism, philosophies of nature or freedom, Schelling in his last phase eventually returned to this key interest of his earlier years. He began as a successor to the philosopher Hegel at the University of Berlin to give lectures on the emerging field, which in a way he founded and coined the philosophy of mythology. I'll be peppering various of Schelling's ideas, specific topics across our course, and eventually we'll be returning to him in the last week, looking into his treatise on the deities of Samothrace. In his historical critical introduction to the philosophy of mythology, on the theme of the mating or wedding Gaia and Uranus, he writes very lucidly, now follows the products of the second element, that is, of the still formless matter, Gaia. This element, matter itself, the Earth, generates initially for itself and without consort Uranus, that is, the higher one. The meaning of this is, the finer part of matter elevates and exalts itself and, as heaven, was separated from the coarser part, which remained as the actual and proper earthly body. This passage shows Schelling interpreting this myth as an allegorical nature myth, indeed as a parable of primitive physics, but also as a parable of the birth of the spiritual, the transcendental, or the metaphysical, Uranos. Schelling goes on, This coarser part is alluded to through the great mountains, and Pontus the sea is mentioned. For Schelling, perhaps stretching things a bit here, sea doesn't mean just the sea, but rather the abyss in general, from the Greek verb pitnine, related to the Latin fundus. Stretch or not, Schelling's point here is to ally Pontus with chaos in some sense, and there's reasons to do this in reading Hesiod, as the children of Gaia and Pontus are indeed the brood of monsters similar to the children of chaos. He goes on, only after the extrusion or birth of that which is higher does Gaia have the meaning of earth as earth. Before the birth of sky on this reading, she was still formless matter. Only in the presence of a sky above does the earth become an earth just like only with an earth can we see a sky. Gaia goes on to enter into reciprocal relation with that which is higher. First product of this is the Titan Oceanus, the ring of water which surrounds the disk of the earth in the Greek way of thinking, and which for Schelling means the cosmic ocean, Oceanus, and not simply the world sea. Oceanus is, in the Greek way of thinking, the swift runner, the water that spreads over everything and fills every abyss. An enormous confusion of the elements accompanies this effusion of the primordial water, such that they shoot about in confusion, hither and thither, upwards and downwards like the waves, until they finally attain a mutually restrictive calm. From Oceanus to Kronos, this is how Schelling basically understands the Titans. They are the children born of Tumult, who come after the primordial waters, the first of them, and are grouped in pairs. As to the essential nature of the Titans, we read in Schelling, and later in Hesiod as well, that the word Titan itself can be derived in the etymology or from the root Titano, meaning the strivers or the strainers, and that they are the force of a wildly straining and unpacified nature. Hesiod himself calls the Titans strainers or overreachers at line 207 of the Theogony. As to the nature of each of the Titans, Schelling draws from the scholar of myth, Gottfried Hermann, a series of etymological identifications that are so richly philosophical that some of them at least must be false. The fact is, many of the Titans are obscure, we hear about them very infrequently, and the nature of some of them is hardly discussed in the later history of Greek mythology. Other Titans become more well-fleshed out figures. Nevertheless, insofar as we attempt to approach Hesiod's Theogony, not only as primordial mythopoetics, but also as physics or metaphysical philosophy can probably do no better than understanding each of the titans in terms of the etymologies here proposed by Schelling. He writes, Each of the pair of titans expresses, in accordance with their names, one of the antitheses which has to be presumed in a nature still under stress and at cross-purposes with itself. Further developing the themes of a primitive physics, the titans Krios and Koyos mean the scissioner and the admixer, Hyperion and Iapetus, the Ascender and Descender. The common concept in the names Thea and Rhea, goddess and flow, is that of being driven away. The difference between Thea and Rhea is that while Rhea simply flows away and loses her substance, Thea retains it. So far, the titans mentioned are not so well developed in later parts of the Theogony or elsewhere in Greek myth. 
We hear very little of Prius and Coius, for example, except who their children are. Hyperion does mean ascender or the transcendent arc and path which the children of Hyperion, such as the moon or the sun, traverse. Iapetus shows up in later Greek myth mainly as the father, Atlas, Prometheus, Epimetheus, and Menoetius. More on them next week. Rhea is one of the most significant titans since she sides with the Olympians against her own generation and continues to be worshipped in distinctive cults throughout the Greek world until its very end. Themis and Nemosune are as well better known Greek goddesses in later myth. Zeus mates with Themis to produce their illustrious children we'll hear about later, with Nemosune to produce the Nine Muses. Normally, Themis means law or custom, the order of civilization, and Nemosune, that is the primordial memory of everything that is, has been, and will be, from the most ancient primordial times to the deepest futurity. Schelling seems to realize he's stretching things a bit when he says, Themis and Nemosune, which in this context, that is, making Hesiod a physicalist, cannot keep the customary meaning. Rather, Themis becomes that which brings what is fluid to a stop, in firm law, for example. On Nemosune, our memory is a power which excites and moves the rigid. Phoebe, the mother of Leto and thus the grandmother of Apollo and Artemis, and Tethys, the primal partner of Okeanos, are as well, of course, also subject to this allegorical nature interpretation. Phoebe is the force which purifies and sweeps away the superfluous, while Tethys is the one which attracts the advantageous. Ultimately, the last of all is Kronos, the completer, the verb krano, and more generally, Kronos means time. Time is the field in which things come to be what they are, and so complete in their being before passing away. We'll have to look more closely into the Kronos Kronos connection later on. Now, this philosophical explanation of the Titans in terms of their nature and etymologies in Schelling is so neat and tidy that it's almost too good to be true. Again, Schelling is here following Hermann, who assures us and affirms that there is not only a thoroughgoing scientific coherence in Hesiod's Theogony, but also even a true philosophy. Hesiod is, in other words, a nature philosopher within the mythic image of thought. This philosophy in Hermann, like in Athanakasis, keeps itself free from everything extra-physical or supernatural, uperfusische in German, and on the contrary only seeks to explain everything naturally. Well, if that's how you read Hesiod, then maybe Hermann's explanation of each of the Titans isn't really so far-fetched. Schelling goes on, of gods in our sense in Hesiod, we often find not a trace. The whole is proof of a way of thinking that one would have to be inclined to hold as more atheistic than theistic. And if one sees how all the way back to the first beginnings and up to the final appearances, only the natural interrelationship is given prominence, then one cannot refrain from judging the author of this interrelationship, Hesiod, does not merely want to know nothing of the gods, but rather that his intent is even polemical, that is, directed against already present representations of the gods. Note here that Schelling is in fact distancing himself from this interpretation of Hesiod in Hermann. Fascinating though it may be, it leads us into conclusions which can't be right. Yes, there is a physicalist aspect in Hesiod's poeticizing, but at the same time, he's a deep theist, especially when it comes to the nature of Zeus and all the sympathetic gods to Zeus in the Olympian order of things. Far more convincingly and straightforwardly, here's how Athanakasis explains the Titans. Judged by what ensues, the list of the Titans we find in Hesiod is strikingly heterogeneous. Some of them are peaceful and harmless, and others bellicose and violent. Although several of the Titans have names that make sense in Greek, as a group they probably represent older pre-Hellenic divinities, which were subdued by the sky god of the invading Indo-Europeans and consigned to eternal darkness. This is an excellent point we also find in later parts of Schelling's philosophy of mythology. Athanakasis goes on, stressing only what is most likely remembered by the average Greek about these myths. Okeanos, as an element, is the great river that flows around the world. Koios, Leto's father, Krios, and Hyperion, or the father of the sun, are more obscure figures. Iapetos is an important titanic figure, especially since he's the father of Prometheus. Theia is obscure, but not so Rhea or Rhea, who is Zeus's mother by Kronos. She is later identified with Demeter, and quite fittingly, with the mother of the gods. Themis is Zeus's second consort, and definitely an old earth goddess. Phoebe is Leto's mother, and Tethys, Okeanus' wife. Kronos is Zeus's father, and although the youngest of the Titans, he is not treated like one of them. 
This is probably all we can say with definitive certainty about the brood of the Titans. Hesiod's theogony can be a bit sparse on the details, which might help us to relate to these primordial deities and the transfer of power from Uranos to Kronos. Reading Hesiod's theogony alone, we're tempted to imagine both Uranos and Kronos as merely cruel patriarchal father figures, perhaps best understood on the Freudian model of the Oedipus complex. And this is why it can be helpful alongside Theogony to read later sources, such as the Orphic Hymns. Also recommended for this course, in the fourth Orphic Hymn to Uranos, we hear, and helping us to connect more positively to the Sky Father. Uranos, Father of all, eternal cosmic element, primeval, beginning of all and end of all, Lord of the universe, moving about the earth like a sphere, home of the blessed gods. Your motion is roaring whirl, and you envelop all as their celestial and terrestrial guard. In your breast lies nature's invincible drive, dark blue, indomitable, shimmering, veriform, all-seeing father of Kronos, blessed and most sublime divinity. Hearken and bring a life of holiness to the newly initiated. And in the Orphic hymn to Kronos, or Father Time, O Kronos, begetter of time, Kronos of contrasting discourse, child of earth and starry sky. In you there is birth and decline, august and prudent lord of Rhea, who as progenitor dwell in every part of the world. Hear my supplicant voice, O wily and brave one, and bring an ever blameless end to a good life. The marriage of Gaia and Uranos gives rise not only to the Titans, of course, but also to the Cyclopes and the Hecatonchires, who we'll turn to now. As we read in Hesiod, moreover, she bore the Cyclopes insolent at heart, Brontes thunder and Steropes lightning, and bold Arges the bright, who fashioned and gave to Zeus his bolt of thunder and lightning. They had only one eye set in the middle of their foreheads, but they were like the gods in other respects. They were given the name Cyclope or Orb-Eyed because one single round eye was set in their foreheads. Might and power and skill were in their works. In turn, Gaia and Uranos were the parents of three other sons, great and unspeakably violent, Cotus, Briarius, and Gaius, arrogant children. A hundred invincible arms and hands sprang out of their shoulders, and also from out of their limbs there grew fifty heads, all supported by their strong limbs. Invincible was the powerful strength in these mighty hulks. Of all the children that Gaia and Uranos produced, these were the most terrible, and they were the most hated by their father from the very first. While the Cyclopes and Hecatonchires may seem to be much less significant children of Gaia and Uranos than the Titans, they do play a significant role in the later battles of the gods and the Titans and the gods and the giants, so it's necessary that we attempt to understand something of their mythological essence. Athanachesis explains the Hundred Handers or Hecatonchires, something resembling primitive man's imagined machine gun. Fierce in battle, but monstrous, and so unloved by Father Sky from the very start. The Cyclopes are most significant as giving Zeus his main weapon and symbol of sovereign power. The lightning bolt, which in Greek myth, as in other world mythologies, is envisioned as a threefold power. The bright flash, the bolt itself, and the thunder which follows. This way of understanding lightning from the sky in terms of a threefold process it's more significant than you might imagine in the history of philosophy and mythology. Extensive Greek and Roman sources, especially Roman sources, associate Zeus with the cult of Earth's being struck by lightning, the Latin word fulguration, which is when a lightning bolt strikes soft sand to produce a crystal. Such objects were revered as sacred, items created when the divine powers of the Cyclopes touched the Earth, symbols of Zeus's sovereign power. The world process itself comes to be understood in later philosophy as a process of ongoing fulguration. Time and the very manifestation of the deity, the power of Zeus, happens ever according to this threefold. Blinding flash, powerful bolt, and rolling thunder. The ancient Mayans as well, in envisioning the conversation or marriage of earth and sky, Quetzalcoatl or serpent goddess and the heart of sky, that the sky god himself could be understood in terms of a similar threefold, and fulgurites were as well sacred objects among the Mayans as they were for the Greeks. We even find them in the archaeological digs of sanctuaries of Zeus as early as the Mycenaean period, as we'll see by the end of this lecture. In the history of Western philosophical theology, 
we often find the view expressed, the world in time is a constant process of fulguration from moment to moment of the divinity. These notions as well going back to the Cyclopes. Most significantly for our understanding of the status of the feminine earth, the textbook points out that Hesiod's first and greatest deity is female. And this might be a basic matriarchal concept of Mother Earth, a remnant from Neolithic times, and of her fertility as primary and divine. Gaia or Gehe, Themis, Sibylle, Rhea, Hera, Demeter and Aphrodite are all either holy or in part divinities of fertility. In the Homeric hymn to the earth, mother of all, we hear about earth I will sing all mother, deep rooted and eldest, who nourishes all that there is in the world. Athanasicus as well sounds this theme when he writes, for most of Hesiod's poem, it is the mother who matters, the male partner is much less prominent or altogether obscure, given the fiercely patriarchal character of Hesiod's own society. This is a remarkable departure from his familiar world and an equally remarkable testimony to the tenacity of the substructure of the mythological pattern. In this case, the pattern which privileges the mother goddess. The fact that Gaia is so central for Hesiod is all the more surprising given that he writes Boeotian Greece of the 7th century BCE and goes on to sing, of course, of the patriarchal world order of Zeus. What's distinctive about Hesiod's Zeus is that, like perhaps in the earlier Minoan mythology studied in the last lecture, this is a Zeus surrounded by and in alliance with many female deities. First of all, Gaia, next Rhea Sibylle, and then many, many others. On the significance of the Cyclopes and the Hundred Handers, Schelling will underline that these personifying names are in part onomatopoeic as they are Greek poetic words and deities which sound like and perform what they say. The Greek kodos means the crasher, Briareus the heavy man, and Schelling explains this mythical pattern of thought by noting that to early humanity a sword might be named the pricker, the fire in a grain, the burner. Again, Hesiod's myths are not superficial collections of hypotheses, but rather theories grounded in long observation and experience, and even precise calculation. In the whole edifice of mythology and every detail in Hesiod's poem, on this reading, we find a type of proto-science that reflects deep wisdom. Schelling also underlines how the stubbornness and presumptuousness of the Hecatonchires, who are not to be neared, horrible and hated by the father, play an important role in the events to follow. For Uranos took joy in the evil act of hiding the Hecatonchires away in a secret part of Gaia, perhaps Tartarus. And this explains why Gaia became pained and resentful, and plots with Kronos, the devious, the youngest and the most horrible of Earth's children, to overthrow his lustful sire, that is Uranos. Not only the imprisonment of the Hecatonchires would be a good reason for Gaia to overthrow her son lover, Uranos, but more gruesomely in Hesiod, we hear several times of Uranos's amorous nature for Gaia, constantly making love to her and imposing his body upon hers without ever letting the children of this union come to light. All the titans discussed previously are trapped uncomfortably in the space of Gaia's womb, just as the Hecatonchires are hidden yet deeper. It's this oppressiveness of the sky upon the earth, again through the theme of rape, the hatred of fathers for sons, which results in the plot or intrigue between Gaia and Kronos, and Gaia gives Kronos a sickle with which to cut off the testicles of his father, Sky. From the fallen testicles and blood are produced by Gaia, not only the Erenyes or Furies of Greek myth, but also the giants and the nymphs of the ash tree or Meliae. The Cyclopes alone seem less hateful to Uranos and in a way preserve his lineage and revenge against Kronos by becoming Zeus's weapon of choice. Here you see a traditional depiction on a Greek vase of the Erenyes or Furies, further depictions in the history of Western art. Before addressing this next batch of three children of Gaia and Uranos, or more precisely, of Gaia and the severed parts of Uranos, take a brief look into Athanasicus on the castration myth. He asks, is this primitive man's rationalization of the separation of earth and sky? Quote, I think it is more probable that the myth is a remnant from pre-Indo-European earth-oriented religion in which the ritual of castration of the earth goddess's consort signified her supremacy of power and perhaps even corresponded to a practice in sub-aboriginal matriarchal societies. This is the theme of the great mother goddess's eunuch as we find in other Neolithic myths. Certain scholars have also seen in the presence of the sickle 
a remnant of a harvest ritual. And this part is pretty fascinating, so perk up your ears. Grain comes from the earth, but it is seed and therefore something masculine, what later Greeks will understand as the spermatic dimension. And as such, it is ultimately attributable to the sky. Man reaps the grain, keeps most of it for his sustenance, and then reseeds the earth. But primitive man may have thought that the original grain seed came from the sky, and thus earth had to affect the castration of sky in order to secure the survival of her children. In an amazing etiology of the castration myth, Athanakasis concludes, primitive man may have felt that in cutting off the grain for his survival, he violated what came from the genitals of Father Sky. And it is interesting that certain Indian tribes in Mexico believe that the hallucinogenic mushrooms that they use grow from what the thunderbolts had planted into the earth. As well in Mayan mushroom cults, as studied for example first by Gordon Wasson in the mid 20th century, the spores or seeds of the mushroom are astral, and in harvesting the mushrooms, the Mayans are separating earth and sky so as to create a habitable zone for the flourishing of human civilization, praise and song. Let's now read the castration scene itself, Theogony 175-190. to Uranos came dragging with him the night, longing for Gaia's love, and he embraced her and lay stretched out upon her, the theme of oppression. Then his son reached out from his hiding place and seized him with his left hand, while with his right he grasped the huge, long, sharp-toothed sickle and swiftly hacked off his father's genitals and tossed them behind, and they were not flung from his hands in vain, for Gaia took in all the bloody drops that spattered off, and as the seasons of the year turned around, she bore the potent furies and the giants, immense, dazzling in their armor, holding long spears in their hands, and she bore the ash tree nymphs of the boundless earth. As soon as Kronos had lopped off the genitals with the sickle, he tossed them from the land into the stormy sea, and as they were carried by the sea for a long time, all around them white foam, Athros, rose from the god's flesh, and in this foam a maiden was nurtured. This is of course the scene of the birth of Aphrodite, the most significant child to emerge from the primordial act of castration of the Sky Father. What a weird myth indeed to be the origin of the goddess of love and sexuality. Now the most famous representation of Aphrodite in the history of Western art is of course Botticelli's The Birth of Venus, of which it's often said that Botticelli removed this myth from its Hesiodic context in order to give it a more urbane and less savage Neoplatonic context. The heavenly goddess of love emerges here in the context of a scene which at first bears no mark of the savage violence we find in Hesiod's castration myth, the goddess Aphrodite is chaste, and her attendants, the winds and the seasons, rush to cloak her modesty and bring her onto earth. There is, however, one telltale sign of the Hesiodic origins of this myth, even in Botticelli. Take a look at these flowers tinged with red. Sure, we can read them as symbols of lily-white chastity that is tainted with just a little bit of the hymenal blood necessary for Aphrodite to do her work in the world, we could also see them as a distant memory of the little drops of blood which fell to the sea as Uranus's testicles were severed. And what became of those little drops of blood? Well, in striking the sea and land, they produced respectively the Furies, the Giants, and the Ash Tree Nymphs. These three figures, quite often understudied, are highly significant, as it turns out that they're the very last children that Gaia and Uranus will ever have together as a couple. The Irenyes or Furies ought not to be confused with the later Fates or Moirai, but the Fates are the children of Zeus and Themis. Much younger, and although still potentially darksome, are less terrifying than this earlier trinity of goddesses, the Irenyes. But also that the Furies in the Hesiodic myth, the first example of a structural theme we'll see across Greek mythology of goddesses coming always in threes. What is the myth really telling us about the nature of the Irenyes, we might ask? Simply that the existence of all rage, retribution, and revenge in the world goes back to Gaia's own rage, as well as Uranus's in being castrated, and perhaps even to Uranus's revenge for this primal separation. The giants point forward to the Gigantomachy, which we'll encounter next week, so we'll cover them more there. 
Regarding the ash tree nymphs, Athanachesis wonders if they are a transitional loveliness, which helps the poet Hesiod make sense of his turn to the birth of Aphrodite in the subsequent lines. Crime of the castration of Uranos, giving rise first to the Furies, then to the Giants, and then to the ash tree nymphs. In other words, something positive comes of this primal crime. The ash tree nymphs may be related to the honey nymphs of the Homeric hymns and elsewhere in Greek mythology, their name Meliae, meaning sweet. They indeed show up to nurse the infant Zeus in the Homeric hymn to Hermes. Of course, the most important and the very last child of Gaia, now via the sea and Uranos, is Aphrodite from Foam or Aphros. And Hesiod himself engages in a little bit of folk etymology at this point in the poem, noting that one of her epithets is Cytheria because after being born, she came to the island of Cythera first, and that her second epithet is Cyprogenes because next she arose by the island of Cyprus. Cythera and Cyprus being ever after two islands which are sacred to Aphrodite, and ones which you can still go and visit today if you want a nice romantic getaway. Lastly, the epithet of Aphrodite Philomedes, which means genital loving, might also be connected to the etymology Philomides, meaning smile loving. That Hesiod seems to also have had a sense of humor at times. The fertility of Aphrodite is of course stressed by the poet. There, this majestic and fair goddess came out, and upon stepping on the land, soft grass grew all around her soft feet. Fair Himeros and Eros became her companions when she was born and when she joined the gods. Aphrodite is especially significant in the structure of the Greek pantheon, because although she's worshipped as an Olympian, she's actually a generation of deity between the Olympians and the Titans, a generation which in Greek mythology has no distinctive name. Other than Rhea, who also becomes an Olympian, Aphrodite in this way points back to the earlier titanic generation of goddesses, as well as forward to the Olympian goddesses, who invariably have complex relationships with her. We'll be spending a whole week on Aphrodite and Eros later on, so for now it suffices to note simply that in Homer and in the Homeric hymn, the gruesomeness of the Hesiodic myth of the birth of Aphrodite is entirely suppressed. Homer speaks of her as born of Zeus and the goddess Dion. Hopefully most of us can see by this point why we really need to go a little bit beyond the textbook to get the full picture on Hesiod's Theogony. For example, in exploring the generation of Titan deities, alongside the divine couple Kronos and Rhea, the textbook only really explores Okeanus and Tethys, Coius and Phoebe, and Hyperion and Theia, which I won't cover here because they do a pretty good job explaining these lineages. The first old man of the sea archetype, Achelous, and the Okeanids, the first nymphs of the sea, will be important figures later on, and we'll have whole weeks devoted to the god Apollo and Artemis. The son of Hyperion and Theia, Helios, is important because of his son Phython, who as well attempts to imitate his father and falls from the sky like Daedalus' son Icarus in the mortal sphere, and the goddess of the moon, Selene, and the goddess of the dawn, Eos, will also be very important figures in Greek cult and religion, as we'll see. Again, it can be helpful in introducing yourself to these Greek gods, to crack open the respective Orphic hymns devoted to them, which help round out the picture from Hesiod, Homer, or the Homeric hymns. And these Orphic hymns in particular are quite stunningly beautiful. After the myth of the birth of Aphrodite, the textbook skips without mentioning an enormous segment of the Theogony itself, over 200 lines in Hesiod's text. This second quarter of the poem as a whole begins from the theme of Uranos's revenge and moves through the generations of dark deities, descendants of Nyx, and thus children of chaos in the broadest sense. And as well, it covers all the generations that stem from Gaia and Pontos, that is, the many broods of Greek monsters. And the poem reaches its middle point with the famous Hymn to the Goddess Hecate. All these parts of the Theogony we'll be covering in later lectures. The main thrust of this second quarter of the poem is to show what a dark, dank, and complex world emerges due to the primal crime, the castration of the father. And as the Titans rose to power, Hesiod goes into these darker elements of the Greek mythological universe here in order to set the stage for the ultimate revenge of Uranos and redemption provided by Zeus and his special relationship to the feminine, to justice, and to male rule. The textbook picks up and will follow suit here with the exact middle of the Theogony, that is, the famous succession myth and begins to tell the tale of the birth and maturation of Zeus and the Olympians' rise to power. At lines 453 to 8, we hear of the relationship of Rhea and Kronos as a second 
troubled hierogamy, sowing the seeds of its own eventual destruction. Rhea succumbed to Cronus's love and bore him illustrious children, Hestia and Demeter and Hera, who walks in golden sandals, imperious Hades, whose heart knows no mercy in his subterranean dwelling, and the rumbling earth shaker, and Zeus, the counselor and father of the gods and men, Zeus under whose thunder the wide earth quivers. The textbook notes here helpfully that Kronos and Rhea are as well deities of earth and sky, doublets, as it were, of Uranus and Gaia, whose power they usurp and their union represents the reenactment of the original sacred marriage. As to the character of Kronos, he is wily, devious, controlling, but also majestic and sad. Sometimes in Greek myth, after his overthrow by Zeus, he ends up in Tartarus, sometimes as the benignant ruler in the Islands of the Blessed. The character of Rhea is here in many ways more interesting and has a longer afterlife in Greek myth, especially as the mother goddess herself, the cult of Rhea Sibylle, often quite ritually close to the festivals of Dionysus. Later sources, she indeed becomes equated with the Near Eastern goddess Sibylle, whose worship spread to both Greece and later Rome, worship involving frenzied devotion and elements of mysticism, often quite close to the cults of Dionysus. Rhea's attendants, the Kurites, are important ritually and in myth. Decked out as warrior dancers, they play wild music on drums and cymbals, and it attends Sibylle as Potniotheron, or mistress of the wilds and her animals. Rhea is already known in our earliest sources, the Homeric hymns, as the mother of the god, quote, through me, clear-voiced muse, daughter of great Zeus, sing a hymn to the mother of all gods and all mortals too. The din of castanets and drums, along with the shrillness of flutes are your delight, and also the cry of wolves, the roar of glaring lions, the echoing mountains, and the resounding forests. In a quite literal sense, Rhea is the mother of all the gods and goddesses to follow who are important in Greek religion. Just like Uranos concealed the Hecatonchires in a hidden part of Gaia, while at the same time insisting on oppressive sexual liaison with her, Kronos as well seems to inherit these sins of the father. Fearful of being usurped in his rule after hearing a prophecy from night, quote, majestic Kronos swallowed each child as it moved from the holy womb towards the knees. His purpose was to prevent any other child of the sky dwellers from holding the kingly office among the immortals. For he had learned from Gaia and starry Uranos that he, despite his power, was fated to be subdued by his own sons, a victim of his own schemes. Therefore, he kept no blind watch, but ever wary he gulped down his own children to Rhea's endless grief. But as she was about to bear Zeus, the father of the gods and men, she begged her own parents, Gaia, that is, and starry Uranos, to contrive such a plan that the birth of her dear child would go unnoticed, and her father's Arrhenes would take revenge for the children swallowed by majestic, sinuous-minded Kronos. First, the great mother goddess Gaia plots with Kronos to overthrow Uranos, and now Rhea, with the help of Gaia, plots to overthrow Kronos himself. This sequence of intrigues is the basis of one of the most important Greek myths of all, the myth of succession. Gaia and Uranos listened to their dear daughter Rhea and granted her wish and let her know what fate had in store for King Kronos and his bold-spirited son. But to the great Lord Kronos, king of the older gods, she handed a huge stone wrapped in swaddling bands. While the Lord Zeus himself was spirited away to be nurtured in secret in caves, where his strength and splendid limbs grew swiftly and the years followed their revolving course. Next, sinuous-minded Kronos was deceived by Gaia's cunning suggestion to disgorge his own offspring. Apparently, he had heard some rumor of the divine child Zeus as the coming king, and needed to check if in fact he had swallowed the real article. And later, of course, he will be overpowered by the craft and brawn of his own son. The Olympian gods and goddesses are disgorged by Kronos in reverse chronological order to their conception, and so the stone swallowed was the last to come out. This becomes in later Greek mythology the famous Umphalos stone, Umphalos literally meaning navel, which was placed at Delphi and thought to be the center of the Hellenic world. The image on the left here is from Delphi. In the spot, the Umphalos stone is supposed to have rested, but it's of course not the real Umphalos stone. A more convincing reconstruction lies in the museum nearby, and you can go and see it. The stone Zeus set up on the broad-pathed earth at sacred Pytho, that is Delphi, 
under the rocky folds of Mount Parnassus, forever to be a marvel and a portent for mortal men. We'll return to the Umphalos Stone later in the course when we do our unit on Apollo at Delphi. How are we to understand the myth of succession in Hesiod's Theogony? Athanasicus notes that the trunk of Hesiod's genealogical tree is the succession myth of four divine generations, Gaia, Uranos, Kronos, and Zeus. Here Hesiod presents us with a succession of three ruler gods, Uranos, Kronos, and Zeus, each of whom supplants his father. Further, each male god incorporates elements of his predecessor, represent in some sense an evolving religious and mythological consciousness, moving ever from nature to civilization and through the stages of natural, historical, the god Kronos or time, inaugurating history of course, and ending in the notion of the perfect individual, Zeus. Considering how complicated Schelling's interpretations of mythology are, it's nice to see him stating the obvious on the myth of succession when he writes, that it has three systems of gods, and in each one, one god is the highest. In the first, Uranos, in the second, Kronos, in the third, Zeus. Thus, these three gods cannot be simultaneous ones, but rather only mutually excluding, and for this reason, one follows upon the other in time. So long as Uranos dominates, Kronos cannot, and should Zeus attain dominance, Kronos must recede into the past. Schelling names this system of mythology a successive polytheism. Now while what Schelling says seems pretty obvious here, the point is of course a bit more subtle. To what exactly do these three rules, the rules of Uranos, Kronos, and Zeus, refer to in the span of human history? Well, simply to the dominance of a particular religious archetype, god, or mythological pattern for religion, the various stages of human evolution. It's common, for example, for students of the dawn of mythology in the Paleolithic or pre-Paleolithic era to posit that here was a nomadic people who worshipped the sky god, traveling around, hunting and gathering, based on the seasons and the signs in the heavens. This was the original reign of Uranos. And it bespeaks a way of life and a religious consciousness which excludes the subsequent ones. Human cultural history subsequently moved, or so most historians tell us, into the so-called Neolithic phase, during which the Earth Mother was worshipped, and the masculine principle of rulership took a second seat. Not quite like Hesiod's system where Gaia comes first, but pretty close, with the rise of the Titan Kronos to dominance, no longer the sky principle, but the rulership of the Earth, for example through agriculture, comes to dominate. Religious culture of the Neolithic and the Bronze Age, early civilizations with their sovereign kingships, in this way resembles the god Kronos. With the birth of Zeus, according to this myth of succession, here loosely applied to what we now know about the historical landscape, Zeus emerges in the end as the urbane, refining, and civilizing god, both of elemental nature and of all the dimensions of human cultural achievement. Deeper than the mere fact of history and the succession of one thing after another, as in the reign of Kronos, the reign of Zeus can be defined in terms of its stability and creative order. And the definition that Schelling provides here of Greek mythology as successive polytheism is fairly apt to describe the facts. Schelling's remarks here are quite structural and philosophical. What does Athanasicus say about the more recent findings? connects the Greek myth of succession to what he takes to be Hesiod's distant sources, such as Near Eastern, Mesopotamian mythologies, perhaps even Egyptian and Minoan mythologies. For it is indeed the case that when we look to the divine pantheons of both Egypt and Mesopotamia, we find this same theme of successive polytheism. According to Athanasicus, it is agreed among most scholars that the Hesiodic account is the result of religious syncretism and the blending of an account of Near Eastern origin with one of Minoan origin. The Near Eastern tale that he has in mind here contains the element of the swallowing of the stone and is best paralleled in the Hurrian Hittite myth about Kumarbi. The god with whom the Hellenic Zeus was identified was doubtless a Chthonic god of generation and fertility, the divine son and consort of the great Cretan earth goddess, whose presence is so abundantly evident in the Cretan art of the Minoan period, studied last week. Gaia, through her daughter Rhea, is again instrumental in the deception and suppression of Kronos, although Hesiod tells us that Uranos was equally instrumental this time in contriving the plot. Like with most everything in Greek mythology, the refrain crops up over and again. By Zeus, Socrates, is this tale true? Certainly the domain that Hesiod is explaining lacks precise historical dates, 
It's a history of myth, not a real history. But does it refer to something real? Is the history and genealogy of gods in Greek myth and old Europe in any way subject to empirical verification? How might we go about confirming that what Hesiod tells us is based in any kind of historical fact? You might think that asking such questions is almost hopeless. But in fact, when we look to Hesiod's narrative here, the concealment and raising of the infant Zeus in various caves, we can at the same time look to the actual caves on the island of Crete and see perhaps if any of them were Minoan or Mycenaean Zeus sanctuaries. Perhaps with some material archaeological evidence we could call into the account. Scholars endlessly debate the precise caves that may have been the sites for Hesiod's narrative here, but a few contenders have been proposed. Most prominently, the myth of the Dictian Zeus may refer to what's now known as the Sicro Cave, an ancient Minoan cave site on the Lassithi Plateau in a district of eastern Crete, associated with the Dictian birth of Zeus. Nowadays, in the Greek tourism industry, this is known as the Zeus Cave, and you can go to see it for yourself. It's pretty magnificent. Apparently, this was the place where the Curetes danced around the infant Zeus making a racket so that Kronos wouldn't hear the cries of the infant. Another contender for the cave that nurtured the infant Zeus is the Archilochori Cave. Yep, the very same one that appears in the video game Assassin's Creed Odyssey and which you can also visit today a bit further to the west in mainland Crete. Of course, Athanasicus seems to know a thing or two about Greek caves of Zeus and helpfully tells us in his notes that there are three Minoan sacred caves in proximity to Lyktos, which is the only locator we get in Hesiod's poem. And these are Sicro, Archilochori, and one in the foothills of Lassithi. Archilochori cave is the closest one to Lyktos, perhaps only one and a half hours on foot. And this, he seems to believe, is the cave mentioned in Theogony line 483, which reads, And so they sent her, Rhea, to Lyktos in the rich land of Crete, just as she was about to bear the last of her children, great Zeus, whom huge Gaia would take into her care on broad Crete, to nourish and foster him with tender love. She carried him swiftly into the darkness of night, and Lyktos was the first place she reached. She took him in her arms and hid him inside the god-haunted earth, in a cave lodged deep within a sheer cliff of densely wooded Mount Aegean. Mount Aegean being what Hesiod actually says here, which is the more ancient name for Mount Dicte, and hence the Dictian Zeus. So which is the cave of the Dictian Zeus, Sicro or Archilochori? Or perhaps yet another, despite the contemporary tradition that makes Sicron the most likely cave, Athanasicus is right in underlying Archilochori as the most likely candidate for the cave that Hesiod is singing of. The archaeological discoveries there are truly astonishing. We know now that it was used as early as the 3rd millennium BCE, with rich finds from the middle of the 2nd millennium, including really astonishing stuff. As late as 1912, the cave had remained unexcavated, even though peasants had collected 20 kilos of Bronze Age weapons from the cave, known as the treasure hole locally. It was only when a gold labyrinth was unearthed by a rabbit and the village turned out to rifle the site, serious interest was taken and Professor Marinatos took charge, discovering hundreds of bronze axes, 25 gold ones and 7 silver ones, and a horde of bronze long swords, in fact one of the longest to be discovered in Europe, and much other treasure beside, most of it dating to the late Minoan period. To complicate matters yet further, there is yet another major cave on Crete, called the Idian Cave, that is the cave of the goddess Dia, and which was also venerated by Minoans and Hellenes alike. By Greek times, this cave was as well rededicated to Zeus, and this cave has also been proposed as a contender. Indeed, in this cave, votive seals and ivories have been found, and like the Dictian Cave, it was renowned as a place of initiation since times immemorial, and may have served as the site of an oracle, since we see the oracular tripod depicted on ancient coins near the site. The Idian Cave is indeed an especially splendid one as you can see, and well worth a visit next time you go to Crete. While all three or four of these caves have something to recommend them, as the nurturing cradles of the Cretan Zeus, to which Hesiod refers here, later mythological traditions introduce yet more caves on the Greek mainland. Much later authors like Callimachus weigh in on these debates about the birthplace of Zeus in the opening lines of his hymn to Zeus expressing a quandary. Should he address the supreme god as lord of Mount Dicte, or Ida in Crete, or as the lord of Mount Lyceum in Arcadia? Here Callimachus avers that he believes the Cretans to be always liars, 
and affirms that Rhea gave birth to Zeus in Arcadia, on the mountain in a holy place, sheltered by a very dense brush. And perhaps there is some truth to this, Hesiod's own account making the birth of Zeus more august and ancient by situating it on Crete rather than the mainland from which he himself poeticized. Indeed, in classical times, Mount Lyceum in Arcadia became the site of an important Panhellenic sanctuary of Zeus. The traveler Pausanias visited the site and tells us that some Arcadians called Mount Lyceum Olympus, or Sacred Peak, because on the mountain Zeus was born. Pausanias even names the three nymphs who brought him up, and accounts for the confusion about the birth of Zeus, Crete, or Arcadia by saying that the mountain itself at that time was called Critea. Zeus was born here in Arcadia and not in Crete, as the Cretans claim. Most interesting of all is Pausanias' identification of a mound of earth as an altar of Zeus at the highest peak of the mountain, from which most of the Peloponnesus could be seen. In front of the altar stood two gilded eagles, and on this altar sacrifices were offered in secret to Lycian Zeus. Here you see the mountain and the site at the top with Lego Zeus and his two eagles. Archaeological excavations at this site have indeed been extremely revealing. New work done in 2004 offered a thorough re-examination of the site, including the altar of Zeus and its sacred area, or Temenos. This gorgeous place, 4,500 feet above sea level, presents an extremely stunning view and might be another great place to visit if you're ever in mainland Greece. Earlier excavators had unearthed material from the altar, dating no earlier than the 7th century BC, but exciting new finds include objects from much earlier periods, the Mycenaean and before, and as far back as the early Bronze Age. Of particular interest are a rock crystal seal, depicting the image of a bull with a full frontal face. It's this amazing image you see here on the bottom left as well as a small bronze hand of Zeus holding a silver lightning bolt and a piece of fulgurite or petrified lightning that is the kind of glass formed when lightning strikes loose earth as we discussed earlier. Many bones were recovered here both large and small from animals but none from humans. The Science Daily Bulletin on this which you can read here concludes it was only fitting that Zeus as a god of thunder and lightning would be worshipped on this stormy mountain peak. The period from which most of these rich finds date is the 14th to 13th century BCE. That is, at approximately the same time that documents were beginning to be inscribed with the syllabic script Linear B, which indeed mentions Zeus as a deity receiving votive offerings in this shrine. Again, in the Greek mythological reconstruction of their own supreme god Zeus, we are struck with the existence of two Zeuses one ostensibly of Cretan origin, and perhaps at that time called by another name, and another, the more dominant one, of Mycenaean origin, as of course it was the invading Indo-Europeans from the north, brought the old Indo-European cult of Zeus Pater in Sanskrit, or Zeus in Greek. Although the location of the birth and raising of Zeus, and even his mythological origins, are shrouded in mystery and frequently disputed, Details of his childhood are remarkably consistent. He was fed by bees, nursed by nymphs, and fed on sheep milk from Amalthea the goat. Protected by the cacophonous music of the Kurites, he grew very strong. Zeus, the male god of the Indo-Europeans, now coming to be born of Rhea, the Near Eastern goddess of motherhood and fertility, is how our textbook puts this. Well, noting that there is a provocative similarity between the depiction of the infant Zeus with Rhea and the depiction of the infant Jesus with Mary, or of the infant Horus with Isis, we might add. As we learned in the last lecture, this constant amalgamation of Mycenaean and Minoan elements, which Hesiod by his time takes for granted, becomes through and after Hesiod and Homer something quite different. Namely, the coexistence of the Olympian gods of Homer with the cults of the mother goddess Demeter at Eleusis. In many ways, the narrative told in Hesiod's Theogony moves between these two poles of Greek religion, on the one hand, Uranian, patriarchal, sky-based religion, and on the other, the religion of women, the Chthonic and the Earth. After growing into a young man, Zeus goes on many other escapades before beginning his battle against his father Kronos. Most salaciously, he spends 300 years in bed with his sister Hera having a good time before he eventually decides that it's time to claim his birthright. The period of Zeus's upbringing as a youth or Kuros is also well attested in the evidence. You can watch an excellent Khan Academy video on the Palacastro Kuros thought to be the young Zeus. 
the tale of the Annunciation of Zeus prior to overthrowing Kronos, and Zeus's first major military act we hear about in 502-6. First, he freed Brontes, Stereopes, and Arges of the Bold Spirit, whom Uranos, their father, had thrown into chains, obviously fearing their power. And the Cyclopes did not forget the favors he had done them, and they gave him the thunder and the smoky thunderbolt and the lightning, all of which had laid hidden in the earth. Trusting in these, he ruled over mortals and immortals. And so begins the great battle which we'll cover in the next lecture, known as the Titanomachy. Well, what an amazing story, but once again, by Zeus, do you believe this story is true? I'd like to conclude this lecture by looking one last time to Friedrich Schelling's overall view of Hesiod's Theogony, in which he finds, beyond legend or fable, what he calls the core, the primordial material of a world split off from ordinary nature and ordinary humanity, the world of the gods. Since mythology is successive polytheism for Schelling, this leads him to understand Hesiod's Theogony in particular as a, quote, system of the gods. And of course, the system of the gods is, in accordance with Hesiod's genealogical image of thought, also a history of the gods. For example, when Kronos is called a son of Uranos, that is for Schelling a natural relation. But when he castrates his father and deposes him from dominion over the world, that is the beginning of a historical relation. For Schelling, what makes this myth true is how deeply it combines nature and history. Quote, the full concept of mythology is for this reason not to be a mere system of the gods, but rather the history of the gods, or as the Greeks say, in simply accentuating what is natural and obvious, theogony. And Schelling's question is the same as our own. Should I take it as truth or not as truth? At this point, we're all probably justifiably overwhelmed with how complicated the study of Greek mythology really is. The question of how did it all begin has become the question of how should we begin? And here, Schelling beautifully suggests beginning completely at the beginning with the question of meaning. Let us imagine ourselves in a position of someone who has never heard of mythology and to whom the Greek history of the gods or a part thereof would now be presented for the first time. That is very much what it's like reading Hesiod for the first time. And let us ask ourselves what his feeling would be. Without question, a type of alienation, in German, Befremdung, would not stop betraying itself with questions such as these. How am I to take this? How is it meant? How has it emerged? You see that these three questions ceaselessly pass over into each other and are basically only one. Actually, Schelling goes on, not much is required to know that every research proceeding from mere facts, research that is for this reason somehow philosophical, has since time immemorial begun with the question of meaning. But before we can truly answer the question of what is the meaning of these myths, we first must ask more trenchantly Schelling's first question, how am I to take this? More precisely, the question is, do I take this as truth or not as truth? Hesiod clearly, with his invocation of the muses at the beginning of the Theogony, suggests what the muses have told him, which he now puts into the song, is proverbially the whole truth and nothing but the truth, the completely understandable truth. But of course, we modern, Schelling included, are not so sure. Didn't the muses also say they know how to tell many a lie, and do so at their whims, being goddesses after all? For Schelling, we clearly can't take the theogony simply and strictly as the truth. For if we were able to do this, then we would not have asked the question. We would not, in other words, be moderns, but rather Greeks who take the existence of their gods for granted. Hesiod's ambition is clearly to narrate a series of true events and to do so in the context of a detailed and understandable poem, just as professors like Schelling have the onus on them to tell the sequence of true myth in a detailed and understandable lecture. When this is done in a lecture or a poem, it will occur to no one to ask what the story means. Its meaning is simply that the narrated events are real ones. This is not Hesiod's starting point, and nor is it the starting point of the philosophy of mythology. Our intention in studying Greek myth is not to presume that there is some storyteller who will tell us the facts of the matter and not the intention to become informed, but it is rather more basically the question of what mythology itself is supposed to be, of what mythology means. When we ask this question, we already confess to ourselves that we are incapable of seeing the full truth in it, that is, in the mythological stories. To some extent, the myths remain myths. 
It cannot be, qua mythology, the narrative of actual true events. But if they are not to be taken as truth, then what are they to be taken as? And here Schelling notes, simply but brilliantly, that the natural antithesis of truth is poetry or poesy in German, Dichtung. And so Schelling resolves temporarily, without however shelving the question of truth, I will therefore take them as poesy. I will assume that they are meant as poesy, and for this reason also have emerged into being as poesy. It's precisely within this determination to understand mythology as poetry, however, that the question of truth needs to again be posed. The question of truth in mythology becoming inevitably the question of the relation of poetry and truth. For there is indeed a truth in mythology, Schelling goes on, but not one that is placed in it intentionally, and thus not one that could be established and expressed as such. The most proper description of mythology is that it deceives us with the echo of a deeper meaning of truth itself, Aletheia, and thus entices us further without ever answering all our questions. For who has ever succeeded in bringing these lost, directionless, and wandering tones into any kind of real harmony? The hues of myth are to be compared to the tones of the Aeolian harp, which excite in us a chaos of musical images that, however, never unite themselves into a whole. The interrelated system of pure mythology would appear to show itself nowhere, like the idea of pure matter, of which the Neoplatonists say, that if one does not seek it, then it presents itself, but if one grasps for it, or wants to transform it into knowledge, then it flees. The attempt to create a philosophy or science of myth is much like this mythological scene. And how many there are who have attempted to capture the fleeting appearance of mythology, but who have, like Ixion in the fable, embraced the cloud of Juno, the goddess Hera, instead. Again, introducing Dechen, for inquirers of the archaic and of beginnings, truth provides a fascinating archaeology. And in archaic Greece, there are three figures, the diviner, the bard, and the king of justice, who share the privilege of dispensing truth purely by virtue of their characteristic qualities. And this is the characteristic quality of a certain kind of speech, shared by the poet, the seer, and the king. At the heart of this kind of speech, for Dechen, as it issues from these three figures is truth, Aletheia. It is in the name of this same power, in the name of the muses as daughters of memory, we hear of the ability to say many false things that seem to be true ones, but also of the knowledge to speak the truth. The signs provided by Hesiod are certainly clear enough. On Mount Helicon, the muses appeared close to him by the altar of Zeus. They breathed a voice into the poet, as will in later myths Apollo, when he gives to the elect the knowledge of things present, past, and future. Having now given a basic account of Hesiod and his cosmotheogony, we'll pick up next week with the creation and the role of humans in Hesiod's vision of the order of things. See you then, and have a great week.